Victor Antonio, welcome to the program. Ricky, pleasure to be on. Looking forward to this conversation. Okay, I meet a lot of people. And, and usually when somebody describes me, it's like somebody who, on caffeine all the time and, and so mm-hmm. enthusiastic about what they do. I have met my match with okay. you. You are, <laughs> I, I, I'm like, I want to bow down to you of your complete inspiration, your enthusiasm, your knowledge and content to get people to, this, this statement doesn't even do it justice exceed their own expectations on every level and grow their business and their personal and professional life. I love Thank you, man. love what you do. I love it. I actually love what I do. I truly love what I do. I, you know, it's, it's, Ricky, it's hard to tell people that because they're like, really? Come on, really? I'm like, yeah, I really do. I really do. I think you have to. If you want to succeed at something and you want people to look at you as an expert in what you are offering, then love what you do. You can't be an expert if you don't love what you do. Here's here's what's even better. I'm gonna you know I do a lot of sales training and and here's and I'm gonna highlight one of the biggest misperceptions or misconceptions in the world of passion and loving what you do. Here's the mistake most people make, and this is why they lose a lot of energy. Is that I always ask people, do you need to love what you do or what you sell? And then me response is Victor, yes, you need to love what you sell. And I'm like, no, that's not a requirement. That's not the minimum. In order to stay motivated, what you should love when you're selling is what your product or service does for the customer. Because it's not about you, it's about what it does. And I think the best of the best salespeople love what they do, check that box, but more importantly, primary, they love what it does for their customer because when you understand how it helps them, man, that's where the motivation comes in. That's really where the power comes in. I remember my earlier days as a young man uh, in college and driving back and forth to the University of Missouri in my beat-up 1978, uh, no, I'm sorry, 80, 78 Cutlass Supreme. <laughs> I had a Cutlass Supreme. I swear, I'm not making this up. I had a Cutlass Supreme. It was my second car. Uh, what year? Uh, I have no idea. 73, 74. It was an old one. It was a beater. It yes. had it had a hole in the floor. If I can tell you this real quick. It was so rusted out because it was like a car that I needed for, for high school. It had a hole in the car and the, on the floor. And what I would do is I put a board with a big brick on top of it so during the winter the snow wouldn't kick inside the car. Cutlass Supreme. Black. I wonder if you had my car. Mine was white. <laughs> but back then, and I'm wondering, mine had an 8-track player. Yes. And I bought a cassette converter so I can mm-hmm. pop in cassettes. And my friend gave me so funny. That's I so funny. A mentor funny. friend that gave, that was fanat- He's literally fanatical about sales and Tom Peters and Zig Ziglar and mm-hmm. uh, you know the list goes on and on. Um, and I would listen to these these tapes all mm-hmm. over and over and over again and how to sell. And it was these little snippets of information that were so valuable, just from write a note to your customer, you know, follow up with a little handwritten note. It's just little simple things. And I've watched your videos and you, you are literally a, a perfect example of this generation's Zig Ziglar. Oh, that's and, a nice compliment. Well, I hope that came as a compliment. Uh, I really do. It's a great, it's a, it's, a, it's a great compliment, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, one of those speechless topic comments. So yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, because when I've watched your su- when, when I've watched your material, and I have, mm-hmm. I've read some of your material. There's a snippet. I'm like, whoa, that's really simple stuff. Why am I not doing this? And, and I'm saying this to myself. So, yeah, again, to say that you speak on sales, I think, is an understatement to what you do. You you are an expert in training, and I'm fascinated. And I just want to dive in this conversation, but and, and I don't mean to cheerlead and, and mm-hmm. really sugarcoat everything here, but. I found your information. I will look back at it and go, wow, this is, again, really good content. I've seen speakers talk about sales, and it's long, drawn process, and it's just, it, they lost me in the first 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. You, you're captivating, first of all. You, you're, you're charismatic. You have a great voice. I, I, I'm, I, I could be your publicist right now, but the point <laughs> that I'm trying to make to you is, is that like, if you're listening to this podcast or watching it right now, you're, be, get ready for some notes. Get ready for notes here. I know that Victor is going to add value. So please stick with us during this entire uh, podcast. I know that you're going to add value and you're going to leave our, our listeners with something to think about. 
Precious. We're going to help him out. We're, we're going to help him out. Not a problem, man. Bring it up. Bring it. Let's bring it. Let's do this. Let's do this. All right. Victor's in, Victor's in the corporate world. You're, you were an employee and got out of the, that, that world because mm-hmm. you felt as though you're, you, and correct me if I'm wrong, you felt you, there was a different purpose for you. Yeah, boy, you really studied me. I, I'm impressed, Ricky. I'm very impressed. You, you did your homework. So I started out in corporate America. So here's, here's a short story. Uh, it's, uh, my family's originally from Puerto Rico, uh, but I was born in Chicago. Uh, and we were poor, not much, you know, not a lot of money. Mother said, go to school, get the education, get the JLB. Decided to get an engineering degree because that's who made money. Uh, got an MBA after that. Worked in corporate America. Started out as an engineer. Eventually found my way to sales. Loved sales. Was successful in selling. And then one day, May 9th, 2001, 3.48 p.m. to be exact, I said, I want to do my own thing. And I'd been wanting to be a speaker slash trainer for, since the moment I saw yours truly, Zig Ziglar. And I'd seen Sig Ziglar like in 95, 93, 95, something like that. And when I first saw him, I actually knew that about you. So that's why I brought brought it up. (laughs) Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So when I I saw him, it was like, okay, whatever that guy's doing, I want to do. And I don't know if you knew this, but I got a chance to share the stage with him. And Jackson, Mississippi shared the stage in the round with him. And um, what a gracious man he was. And then I remember driving home. And the biggest smile, I looked like a little kid, man, who just basically ate all the candy in the candy store. And I was happy. I was like, it was a beautiful moment. They always say, don't, you don't want to meet your idols because they'll disappoint you. No, no, no. I wanted to meet the idol. And he did not disappoint. He exceeded. I, um, I've said that before. There was, there was a point where I wanted to meet somebody or I was given the opportunity to meet somebody. And I passed because I was a little concerned that I'd be disappointed by their... Um, Really, really? Yeah. And so do you I, want to I, share? Do you want to share who that was? Do you want to share who that was, Ricky? Come um, on, come on, come sure, on. Sure, I'll Ricky. tell you. It's, it's not a big deal. I, I was, I was actually at a concert, and I'm a mm-hmm. huge fan of Sting, and mm-hmm. I was with the producers, and um, there was an opportunity to maybe even push to go backstage and meet him, and I go, no, it's okay. This is why I came. Mm-hmm. I came to see him perform, and I actually um, passed on going backstage to meet him, and I figured, you know what? Seeing him live is more to me of you know, uh, a little mm-hmm. more. I didn't go there to, to meet him. Anyway, so I digressed. Cool. But, <laughs> That's all right. Cool. Yeah, I know. Didn't really mean anything. But anyway. Um, so he, here we are. Fast forward. You're not only a, a phenomenal speaker, trainer, an author of h- how many books? Because I'm going to botch it. No, so, soon to be 14 books. Yeah. yeah. You're busy. You know, well, I've been doing it for a while, Ricky. I, I, you know, when I when I started becoming a speaker slash trainer, I started out in the motivational world. I uh, wrote my first book called The Logic of Success, which is kind of semi autobiographical, and so so wrote that. But eventually, I wanted to move away from motivation and get back into sales slash sales training. And then I've been doing that since 2008, which puts me on a 13 year track of just doing sales and training. Well, okay, you, you made a very good point. You were in the motivational business. Now you've, mm-hmm. you've pivoted and mm-hmm. really more in the trainer aspect. And, you know, I don't know if even trainer even does it justice. It's a blend. I think it's a blend. I think the one of the things I've tried to blend is is motivation with education. I know a lot of people say that, but that's the, that's, the, that's the hat trick I always try to pull off, which is how do you keep people engaged? How do you give them content? And how do you give them something that makes them go, huh, never looked at it that way. Wow, never thought about that. Really, you can do that? And if I can do that with an audience, that's when I know I have them. So I think people are always motivated when they walk out of my sessions and they go, I know what to do. I got it. I'm clear. I think that's where real motivation comes from. It's, it's really intrinsic. You know, I think uh, Daniel Pink wrote a book, it's a wonderful book, called uh, A Drive, where he talks about, you know, biological needs, physical needs, and then he really talks about the internal intrinsic need, that that's where the real drive comes from. And I think when people know that they can do something, and they believe they can do it, like in sales, that's when they're really motivated. So what, may, what, what motivates you? I think motivating me is when, you know, first of all, I like to tell people I'm a, I'm a pure capitalist. You know, I'm the capitalist and the capitalist. I like making money. I don't deny that because I believe in the quid pro quo of life. Value for value. That's my equation. Value for value. If I give you value, I expect value in return. If I give you great training, I show you how to sell more, how to grow your revenue. I expect you to pay me. And I love that relationship. And people have a hard time having that discussion. I don't. Because what really 
put the money to the side for a second. What really jazzes me up is I, I got an email this morning. It, it, another, and I'm sure you get many of them also. When somebody says, I saw the video. I kept watching your videos. I tried doing certain things. A month ago, I was struggling. Here's where I'm at. I'm about to hit quota for the first time. I'm super happy. I'm comfortable. And then they start telling me about their family and how that's going to impact their family. And that right there, man, that's, that's just a took the cherry on top. When you have a profound effect on somebody's reality and livelihood and personal life, it's hard to put an understanding to that to other people unless you experience it. And this isn't a bragging mm -hmm. thing. This is a mm -hmm. rewarding thing. I, I had a client reach out to me, and, I'll sh and I think what you're saying is the same thing. And said, hey, thanks so much. You made such a big difference. Well, th it was a validation of everything I'm doing. All right, but the point is, is that at the end of the day, it was so rewarding that all the hard work that we put into our content and delivering is showing the results. Yes, we get paid. And yes, I, I, I like to you know grow my business, and yes, we like to be profitable. But in essence, we could do anything else. We could, there's a lot of things we could be doing. Mm -hmm. But when you really love training, the rewards come from that are beyond money. I think so. I think, you know, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The, the, the base level is the, the basic survival, you know, basic survival. To, and the top peak is self-actualization. I think self-actualization, I think, is what we all strive for. Move beyond the actual needs, move towards self-discovery and do what you want to do. I think that was part of the reason why I left corporate America, because I was like making like crazy, crazy money. And we were poor, so I'm making crazy money now. I tell my family I'm quitting my job. And they're like, what? Are you crazy? Because you're making crazy money. And... My mother, I remember, didn't understand. She goes, I, I don't understand. You're president of sales and marketing. It's a $420 million company. You want to what? Go on your own. And, and I remember the, uh, and I tell the story. I, I did a documentary. I don't know if you know, Rick. It's called The Motivator. And it's online for free on YouTube. And it basically tells the whole journey. But, you know, when I quit, I was making like 250000 That was my base salary only. Commissions on top of that, stock options. It was a nice package. When I quit and decided to go solo, May 9th, 2001, uh, so the next six months, my my end of year revenue total was only seventeen. That's one seven, seventeen thousand dollars. And it was at that moment I go, you know what? I think I need to kind of ramp this up a little bit. And I remember I said, that's what I, I really have to get, become better at marketing. And that's the biggest lessons I learned about being on your own. You got to market, man. No matter how good your product or service is, you better know how to market. A question comes up when, in my world about when somebody asks me about mindset or relaxation and stress, mm -hmm. and, and they're having trouble with it, they, they mm -hmm. always ask me, what's the first step? You know, but, okay, I get it, but what's the first step if it's not working? You're sharing right now, you know, you, you, to being present and also being aware, sit in the audience and realize, hey, listen, you, you might know your product, you might know your client, but maybe you're not mm -hmm. doing enough in the marketing area. You sit back in the audience, you start to self-discover quicker than somebody actually telling you what to do. Do you, what do you, what do you think the number one, or is there a number one question that you would ask the most as, okay, as a sales trainer, a coach, a guru, an expert, is there a question that you could ask the most? That I get asked the most? Yeah. The question I ask, the question I ask myself the most is, and I think is the most important was, how do I make that work? That's the question I've always asked myself. Okay, okay how do so I make this get, work? You get asked that question, but what about people asking you? Is that the same question? The question... The question I always get is such a general question. It's like, well, Victor, how do you do it? How do you do it? How did you do it? That, that variation of how did you do it? How do you do it? What they're really asking me, Rick, is how did you get to where you're at? You know, that's what they're looking for. And it's always, it's such a tough question to answer because they don't see the trail of tears of all the things that didn't work. And so how do you, how do you within a, let's say you're at an event, and within, you only got like 30 seconds, maybe a minute with the individual. And they say, well, how'd you do it? And I'm like, well, I, I can't tell you this in a minute. So I, I give them some standard, like, look, don't give up, figure out a way, find a way to make it work, right? But the, if I were to detail this out, it would go something like this. I figured out what I wanted. Was I clear on how to get there? Absolutely not. But my brain said, we need to move in that direction. Now, there's north, there's south, there's west to east. Now, all you got to do is pick a general direction. Most people say, you got to figure out where you're going out exactly. No, I never figure out where I'm going exactly because I don't know. But I know I want to move north, Ricky. And my north was, I want to do training. I want to do sales training. How am I going to get there? I have no clue. But I know that the best speakers and trainers, here's what they do. 
They wrote a book. Okay, let me go write a book. Oh, they're doing videos. Oh, man, look at those videos. Let me go do some videos, right? Oh, they're doing podcasts. Let me go do podcasts. And I would sit there and check everything off. And I would try to continue to improve. It's like that, that, that Japanese phrase, Kaizen, right? It's like continuous prove, improvement. You're working on it. And it's hard to tell people that because they, they want to see, they want the quick answer. How did you do it? How did you get there? And it's a tough question to answer when the reality is it's always a work in progress. We're always trying to figure something out because the market changes. Right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. But you're still going to have people, and I understand that. I, I envision and I can actually see these people that ask me the same question. How do I do this? How do I do this? I don't, it, I don't know if it's a matter of they want they're, they're, that they're lazy. I think they're stuck. They're stuck, I think, in a way of, of mindset in the old programming. Well, I'm doing the right things. I'm doing everything I can possibly do. It is, it is mindset. It, it, it isn't laziness. So I'm with you on that. Nobody, nobody wakes up going, I don't want to do anything. I want to be a failure for the rest of my life. Nobody thinks like that. But this mindset, it's almost like, uh, you know, that's the Rubicon, right? That's the, the, that you have to cross. It's a big, it's a big headline, right? But other, underneath mindset, and you know this, I'm preaching to the choir, there's fear, uncertainty, there's doubt, there's question about why, where do I go, passion, is it really what I want to do? I got all these financial responsibilities, how am I going to get there? I don't know where to begin, I'm just so lost, equals what you just said, I'm so stuck. Let's play, role play for a second, is it human? Sure. Okay. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a realtor, I just got my license, um, I've been mm -hmm. out for three months, I've made one or two sales in three months, which is pretty good. If you're out there mm -hmm. for three months and you've closed a house because of closing and escrow and inspection. So I've closed a couple houses mm -hmm. and there's a lot more realtors now in the market because it's a growing market. We're talking about the current situation, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just, I'm not where I want to be, Victor. Um, I, I, I know I could do better. Uh, I know I could be a better salesperson, and, and, and I know I'm throwing this at you, you know. No, no. Right well, let, let's do this, man. I, this, is what I, this is what I live for. So I, first question I would ask you back is I said, Ricky, tell me about those first two deals that you got. Walk me through that process. How did you get those two deals? All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So then I described to you about, oh, it was a friend uh, of a friend said I was in the business, and so but they introduced me. The second house, uh, I just, I got really lucky. I got lucky, and mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it, was, it was another one that just fell on my lap. So, you know. Right. You know, so then I, so, let me, so let, 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 let's split those apart then, Ricky. Let's split those yeah. apart. Let's look at the one with referrals. So a friend of a friend send you a car and then they actually called you is that true you're gonna say yes, yeah victor exactly. that's true they actually they, they called me i said what was that conversation like like how far into the buying process were they were they ready to make a decision or did you you know in other words were they looking for a realtor or did they just make a connection with the realtor you may say no no no. they were looking for a realtor oh so they were ready to buy so what we need to figure out is finding out people who are ready to buy let me ask you something uh how do you keep track of your friends right now and you're gonna say well what do you mean keep track of my friends like yeah how do you keep track of your friends and then let's say you say Whatever you tell me, I keep track on here. I got some email, this and that. I said, what if we can compile a list of all your friends? I said, does every single friend you have today know that you're in real estate? Does every single friend literally know that you want to help people buy houses? Does every single friend has at least your business card? And when was the last time you contacted them? Because let's begin with what we can do. And what I'm trying to do is create in the person's head momentum. This is what I can do. Because we feel stuck when we don't know what to do. You know, the and so... What that little example right there is, let's do that first. So now we got that line of defense. Now, so now I'm going to make you write a, a what's up card to everybody, right? And you're going to come up with the list. And by the way, the challenge to you is I would say, I said, I need you to come up with at least 150 friends. Everybody has at least 150 friends. You got it. Family, because you just give me 150. And then what you're going to do is put them all in a database. I don't know, get a little CRM, right? Let's get them out there. Go to MailChimp, one of those, whatever, email contact. Let's get everybody in. Let's get everybody in the list. That's the first step. Can you do that? They're like, yeah, yeah, I think I can do that, Victor. All right, let's do that first. Then, here's what you're going to do. Once we got everybody else, we're going to do a personal hand. I'm, I'm making this up, right? Do a little thank you note to everybody and just, and then what I want you to do every day, I want you to call five of these 150. That should keep you busy for the next month, right? And then guess what you're going to do? We're going to cycle through. They're going to probably give you referrals. Now, here's what you're going to ask them. When you call them, don't just call them to say hi. That's the first call. The second time you call, we're going to ask them for something. Hey, by the way, do you know anybody in the market who might be interested in real estate? And that's how I would do it. And when I, when I do that with people, it's like, again, it's about motion. Sometimes people get stuck because they don't know what the first step is. But it's amazing when you tell people, here's all you got to do, 150. 
you know, da-da-da-da, contact them. We're going to call five a day. After we cycle through the 150, we're going to be in that cycle again. But in the second phase, we're going to make the ask, which is we're going to ask for a referral. Because nobody wants to be called cold, and then you ask them for something. So the first one is to kind of, you know, warm it up a little bit, and then call them a month later and say, hey, and whatever it may be, ask for referrals. And that's how I would do it. And then let's talk about your luck. And then I would break the luck down. Let's see what you're doing with the luck. How did you get lucky? And maybe it is pure luck. So maybe we come back over here, we focus on that. Does that help? It doesn't help. You know, it, it applies to every business in a way that you're, if you're just starting mm -hmm. out. And it also, I think, it applies to somebody that's seasoned. And I'll tell you why. Because you made me step back and get outside of what I thought I should be doing, what I should be doing. And mm -hmm. maybe this might not work for everybody, but when I say you should be doing, you should be looking for different ways to look back at what is going on in your business mm -hmm. and create a different mindset of programming to give you an alternative. We've all heard the expression, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Pivot during this whole entire time. Try to figure out what people's needs are. But I think we really find out what our abilities are when we step back. And you made it very clear. It was easy for me to listen to you. I envisioned myself as that realtor. And um, you, gave me, you gave me some new structure of an update of a programming. And mm -hmm. I call it my, 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 my daily mindset app. You mm -hmm. gave me the ability to rewrite some new script. And, and that's, a, that's a powerful thing as a coach. So... That, again, identifies you as a coach versus a motivational person because you're motivating mm -hmm. when you spoke. Mm -hmm. However, you gave me – I was envisionalizing the steps as we were going along. And, by the way, I was thinking about how does this apply to the dentist office? How does this mm -hmm. apply to the uh, food delivery service? Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. Yeah, I mean, you could – once you start digging into this stuff, like uh, one of the books I wrote about uh, Sales X Machina, which is how artificial intelligence is changing the world of selling – and once you study AI, it's really interesting if you start thinking like an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And the algorithm is always looking for some insight, something new. It's looking for the angle. It's looking for what's going on. And so let's go back to the real estate example. Let's say that's one approach. I said the other approach could have been, I said, hey, by the way, what type of person bought from you? What was that person's demographic? Mm -hmm. You say, well, it was a white male, right, married, more. Okay, they had two kids, great. Okay, they had just moved to Atlanta. Okay, great. And what was their profession? And you may say, lawyer, whatever it may be. And I said, I said, have you ever thought about maybe focusing in on lawyers as your market? They seem to move around a lot, and I'm making this part up. But there's so many ways to approach it. It's just figuring out a pattern. And, I, and I'll give you a personal example. The, when the pandemic hit in March, I remember I was, in, I was finishing up my first quarter run of speeches and training. And I got back to Atlanta here on the 13th, March 20th, lockdown. <clears throat> Within a month, if that, I told my wife, I said, we're done for the year. And that's when I said, okay, what do we now do? What do we do? And that's when I'll use your word or, and Sam Silverstein's pivot word, right? That's what I said, let's pivot. Let's move everything virtual. And then I redid the whole studio. And then... I just started cranking out content, creating new content, you know, my, my sales after dark show. I was just creating stuff just to create some buzz. But I felt, Ricky, that I had to move. I had to do something, almost like a shark. You just can't stand still. You got to do something. And again, did I know what I was doing and where I was going? The answer is no, but I knew I was going north, which I know I had to do certain activities. And then the amount of business that came my way was just incredible. It was the law of attraction kicking in because I put content out into the universe. Good content. Again, you didn't wait for a couple months to see what would happen. And a very hmm. similar thing happened to me. That last time on stage on platform was uh, February 23rd. And hmm. that week coming home, literally I was getting calls every day, one a day, two a day of all these events just, you know, Cancel, pause, cancel, pause, cancel, 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 cancel. Pause. And then, it yeah. was, you know, let's, you know, so it was very, and I remember the very, and we still joke, the client that did this, um, the very first canceled event, very large, it was 800 people, and we still talk because we, he's rescheduled and, we, we, you know, we're, we become friends. Um, and he said, can you believe it? You know, we were like the, the first to, to, to cancel during that time. But you didn't, you know, you didn't cancel in delivering. You didn't cancel in coming up with a way to, you know, to do what you're doing. Um, it is interesting, though. But I think that there's there's something about it. And there's, 
like you said, it's looking at your marketing, looking at what you're capable of doing. And if it's something new, you know, my listeners have heard me say this a million times, you have to embrace the unfamiliar and release yourself from the familiar. When you embrace the unfamiliar, you then grow. Whether you succeed or failing, you grow. What does that mean? Well, if you fail at something, you've tried something, and you know what? Maybe that gets you to try a little bit harder to do it better the next time. Yeah, I, I like to tell people that the even pre-pandemic, you thought you were in control, but control is all an illusion. It's just a big illusion. And so when people talk about, you know, again, the whole stepping out of the comfort zone, I get all that. Look, we're all in the uncomfortable zone. You know, there may be people who have a little more money, feel a little more secure, but that can be wiped out tomorrow and they're insecure. And so I think when people understand that the pain of the same, because this is when people move, when the pain of the same is greater than the pain of change, mm-hmm. that's when people said, okay, I'm going to do something because I can't do this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. And some people, it just takes them a while to get to that threshold where they go, you know what? I don't know what, but something has to change. Right. And then once you get over that hump is how do you execute? As you're talking about, what's the executable? What do we do? And I remember when I started sales trading, just to talk about negative mindsets, uh, uh, I said, I'm going into sales trading. And I even wrote a contract to myself. Like I wrote April 2nd, I wrote at uh, 2008, I wrote a contract out to myself. We will dedicate ourselves to sales training, blah, blah, blah. And I just wrote, just wrote the whole thing out, still have it. And I remember I was telling my friends about this, and I remember one guy said, he said, well, Victor, you know, there's a lot of competition out there. I said, I don't know, I understand. He says, yeah, but there are a lot of people who are just doing a lot of big things out there. And they, they brought up people like, you know, whether it's Brian Tracy, Tom Hopkins, uh, Jeffrey Gittimer, and people like that. I go, I get it, I get it, they're out there. I just don't care. And I just, it, and I went with blinders on in a good way. I, I purposely said, you know what, I'm gonna figure out how to win. And the more I studied what they were doing, the one weakness it was almost like the Sun Tzu art of war type of thing. Attack where your anim- enemy's weakest. And one of the things I saw they weren't doing, Ricky, was video and video consistently. And I said, ah, that's it. That's my approach. That's my angle in. And that actually turned out to be a very good angle in because it got me more attention. I couldn't compete with people on the number of books they had, uh, the publications they had, the widespread syndication of some of their articles. I couldn't compete with that. I couldn't compete. Speakers bureaus didn't want to even listen to me. I told them I had all this experience. They didn't care. So you know, I said, you know what? I'm going to do this on my own. And then I used video as my leverage point. Well, you also brought something up that I think is really important. You said the word competition. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've been asked this question before in the past. It's always a trigger word for people. I know it's always a trigger word for people. <laughs> but somewhere, and I don't know when, and please mm-hmm. Don't look at me with the that I've got a big head here, but I want you yeah. to work with me on this. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that there's competition if it's, if it's regarding an individual. I would agree with that. There's only one Victor Antonio. I would agree with that, actually. I, when I use the word competition, and you know, I, I should I should probably find a different word. I well, find no, people I, I, who are I think, in my I space. Think you're on it. I think that's a great yeah. way to start the conversation with that because yeah. because you could start with. There is no comp- uh, competition because there's only one me. Right. No, and that part I get. I when I when I when I when I talk about competition, because this is a reality. We do have competition. The the thing is, we're compete. There's only one you, but you're competing for buyers' minds, right? right. And it's. It, but I always say this up there, and then I, I flip back to there is no competition because every buyer has their flavor. Just like you have multiple artists on your on your phone as far as music, so do buyers, right? They'll like Ricky better than they like Victor. Some like Victor better than they like Ricky, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Our job is to put our best foot forward and be as competitive in terms of content delivery, presence, and all that good stuff. And so I, I think competition is a good thing. Yeah. But I don't, it, it should not be okay. – you, sh, you, you shouldn't let it impact who you are right. and let it right. intimidate you. That's the key factor. It, it should never intimidate you. It should be mm-hmm. fuel. To really identify and it is fuel on your yeah see that's i love that see i love that because to me it is fuel it fuels my hate fire now i say that to be like what do you mean your hate fire no here's what i mean by hate fire when somebody's doing something good like when i come across a great speaker it makes me mad like this hate fire gets in me but i love the speaker first of all i thank the speaker mentally because i go i love it when i come across a good speaker 
because we're human individual speakers are people and people love to hear great speakers so i love coming across a great speaker when i used to listen to zig ziglar jim Rohn, i go god i hate it because they're so good <laughs> oh but i love it you know what i mean you're like oh i hate no, them because i, I absolutely uh, I, I think it's in our yeah. it, it, maybe it's in our dna i, I feel very huh. much the same way but at the same time it is well, go ahead and i'll, I'll i love no no it's like, i i love your delivery Oh, but I hate that I can't do that yet. I love your delivery, and I hate that I can't do it. I want to find a way to get there. That's hate fire. That and I, That's positive hate fire. And so when I have positive hate fire, I get stuff done. I mean, I get stuff done. Well, it, it can almost be looked at, and it's not fear, but that fire is your fuel. Fear is my fuel at times. <laughs> fear of getting too comfortable. Fear of not being on top of my game. Mm -hmm. See where I'm going with this because it makes me work harder to deliver a program, to deliver content. See, to serve see my and, and you, and you get it. You get it. That that fear is fuel. It really Absolutely. is. So people always ask me, Victor, what's your biggest motivator? You know, was it your mother? Was it your father? Was it some type? No, fear. Fear was my biggest motivator. I was I was uh, scared of always being poor motivation. I don't want to be poor. You know, why did you get an engineering degree? Because I want to make money because I didn't want to be poor because I'm afraid of being poor, right? And so we're always like this. And I think fear, if twisted, bended to our will, is used correctly, it is, as you say, it is fuel. I, I, and I'm going to piggyback on that. I love the fact that you use the word bend it, bend it, shift mm -hmm. it. That's right. Just It's, it's almost like, a, like, like anything else. When I hear people talk about fears, like, well, you got to overcome your fears. I'm like, no, no, embrace that fear, as you said earlier. Hug that baby. And I say, come on, let's do this. Because the, the biggest fear, and I'm going to state the obvious, but sometimes you need to repeat the obvious. The, the biggest fear any person should have is regret that you didn't do it. You didn't try it. You didn't take a shot. Agreed. I don't mind. Agreed. When people say they did something and they failed at it, I go, ah, as you pointed out, ah, there's growth in there. I said, I pity the people who always talk a good game but don't do squat. All they do is talk. I feel sorry for those people because they never rolled the dice, Ricky. 1,000%. And we go back to it's okay if you fail at something. If you look at it as a way, if you're going to move forward, you look at all the mistakes that maybe held you back so you don't make them again. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you, 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 take, you learn something. You take what was good. You leave what was bad. And again, I think, you know, when people look at you and I and ask that question, you know, how did you do it? How did you get to where you're at? What they don't see, and I'll say the phrase again, they don't see the trail of tears. The trail of tears is all the stuff that did not work. You know, you and I, you know, we had another, before this, we had a conversation about technology. I don't know. I, I got in my closet over here what I call the box of woes. The box of woes is the equipment that didn't work, something that I bought, shouldn't have bought, something that just isn't working, piece of junk, the whole bit. And... Again, two ways of looking at that going, you see, there's no point in buying things, Ricky, because they never work and they just never work out for me. That's the pessimist. The optimists go, well, that didn't work. Let's find something that will work. You know, that's the difference. Or you buy equipment or you buy things and don't even try to say, figure out how to use it. Right. Yeah. Which I think that's, this is, again, you know, people in business, they might have a CRM. They, they, they're afraid of using it because they're fear of the unknown. Maybe they, they have that feeling of, I am not good with technology. Well, in my world, if you say I'm not good at something, you work really hard to win to fail. Yeah, Plain it's funny because my yeah, in my first book, The Logic of Success, I talk about this. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, the father of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, Dr. Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania, and he wrote a book called many years ago called Learned Optimism. And one of the, one of the takeaways of the book, Learned Optimism, was really interesting. He said, when somebody says something like that, I'm not good with technology. Your job, if you care, is to challenge that notion. Because that's the only way people are going to grow. So when people, I've had that, people say, Victor, I'm not good with technology. And I always say, nice phone. That's all I say, nice phone. Because that's a piece of technology, isn't it? Right? And then I go, and you know, like car, hey, nice car. That's a piece of technology. So what do you mean you're afraid? And what they're saying is they don't know where to start or they're afraid of failure. And again, I just remind them, Boom. it's part of the Boom. process. Boom, you just, you just said a fear of failure or preconceived outcome that hasn't even happened yet and because we play it out because as we get older, we have more scenarios to choose from versus a 
eight-year-old playing in the sandbox to a 16-year-old getting ready to drive for the first time to now as an adult, you know, with the with so many things going on, we have so much of di so many different scenes that we start playing out that hold us back. Oh, I agree. The uh, you know I always joke about the word rationalize because people always rationalize what they can't do, and that's the ability if you break the word up to rationalize to themselves. <laughs> and what people do is they is is that they lie to themselves. They 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 get into this. Well, I can't do that. Here's why. But nobody ever questions them, or they don't they don't say it out loud because somebody would call them on there. And and what I've learned that people who rationalize again, we go back to what you were saying. They're stuck. And that, that mindset is because all this fear, doubt, uncertainty, whatever it may be, is there, and they just simply don't know where to begin. That's what they're really saying. So let's do this. Before we leave today, um, would you, and I'm putting you in the spot a little bit, but I'm sure you've been asked sure. the question, what takeaway can you give somebody, they're an entrepreneur, they're in sales, they're in customer service, or, or they're just challenging themselves now to, you know, use the word pivot, you know, from again, mm -hmm. I'm a, our, our friend Sam Silverstein, what, what what kind of direction if you had to guide somebody right now? Whatever product or service you're offering today, whatever product or service you're offering today, all you have to do is really sit down and figure out what's the value. Now, let me be clear what I mean by value. If it's a B2B situation, the value is how can your product or service help somebody do three things, increase revenue, reduce costs, or expand market share. Let me say it again. If you're selling B2B services or product, your product or service, how do you help a client increase revenue, reduce costs, expand market share, or all three? If you can define that, then you can have a real conversation with your clients. If you're in B2C, and if you're doing B2C, there's three things people want to know. If you're selling, let's say, I don't know, you're in network marketing, multi-level marketing, right? People want to know how can this pill help me physically, psychologically, or financially. Those are the three, physically, financially, or psychologically, or all the above. If you can figure out how to tie it to those specific value points, then you have what I call a real sales pitch. It's not ethereal, it's not in the air, it's specific. I'll give you an example, I'm talking to a client, sales training, he says, Victor, I don't think I need sales training. I said, well, tell me what your close rate is. He'll tell me, I said, I said, you're below the industry average. Now let me show you how much money you're losing because of that. And by the time I get done with my pitch, they're basically giving me their money because they realize how much they're losing. That's what you need to make people feel. People will, uh, you know, really go after loss aversion. Loss aversion, if I can show you what you're missing out on, what you're losing, that will cause more pain than me trying to tell you what you'll gain from my product. You've been taught to sell the feature, the benefit, the advantage, and the gain. Great. You got to do that. But let me tell you where the real power lies. The real takeaway under all this is you got to sell the pain because people are loss averse. that They don't like to lose money. They don't want to lose revenue. They don't want to spend too much. They don't want to lose market share. Physically, they want to feel better. And if you're telling me I'm not doing well, then I want to know that. So remember, you can sell the gain, but selling the pain is that much more effective. This is valuable. So if you're listening to this, I hope you, you hit pause and you go back and listen to that again and take notes. And if you didn't hear me correctly, yes, hit pause and rewind and listen to Victor again. And if you want to know more about Victor Antonio, I'm going to put all his information uh, and a link to his site, his coaching, his training, his books, everything at rickykalman.com. Inspire yourself, challenge yourself, and become a better solution provider than a salesperson. Check out Victor. Victor thank, thank you, Ricky, for having me on the show. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, first time we connected, um, I was compl I said to you, okay, man crush, let me see that studio you got there. <laughs> and we just started tech talking technology, and we just, you know, I felt, you know, very connected very quickly. And I'm so glad, to, and, I, and, and to, I hope I can call you a friend. Thank you very much. Yes, you can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>